All right, guys. Uh, here's the vodcast. I promise you guys on digestion and excretion. And since you guys, as you guys know, I'm a big deal. I did a uh, Prezi, and it's awesome. Uh, so the next unit we're gonna be talking about digestion and excretions, chapter 30. And I know we've already covered a lot of this when we were talking about the animal systems, and now we're gonna go in a little bit of detail. And the main point of this uh, vodcast is to just get you uh, reoriented with everything what I ex what I'm expecting us to to be able to go over and give you some. Uh, introductory material that you can go over and then we can actually do some uh, activities in class you can actually answer some uh, questions in class so let's start go ahead and start with the lesson overview so what I'm going to talk about in this podcast is going to be uh, tissues and systems we're going to kind of review the human body and how the cells make tissues and tissues make up the different organ systems of the body we'll then go uh, to quickly overview homeostasis and uh, feedback inhibitions to find these terms and actually talk about what they mean uh, well then, I'll give you a quick overview on food, calories, and a balanced uh, diet. Basically, why we have to eat a balanced diet and why it's good for us and how it supports uh, our tissues and our systems and homeostasis and feedback inhibition. And then we'll quickly review uh, digestion, the different parts of it, and also excretion. And this is kind of serve as a springboard for us to go into more detail in class. So let's jump right into it uh, with the tissues and systems of the body. You can think of like the tissues are made up of different types of cells and these cells are usually be grouped into four main tissue types. Uh, either epithelial tissue, connective tissue, nervous tissue, or muscle tissue. And they each have different functions. Epithelial tissue is really anything that's going to be in contact with the outside world or stuff that came from the outside world directly. So this is going to be your skin, the lining of your digestive tr tracts, and, and certain glands that are in contact with the outside world. And they're going to aid in protection, absorption, and excretion of materials. You also have uh, connective tissue. This is going to be things like your ligaments, uh, your bones, things under the skin, the surrounding organs, and things that are hold things in place. And um, they bind epithelial tissue to structures and provide support. Nervous tissues are made up of your neurons. These are going to be the things that actually receive and uh, information from the outside world and help process it so that we can actually have some sort of response. This is going to be your brain, your spinal cord, and your nerves. And then of course muscle tissue is going to be in charge of actually outputting those responses. And uh, These are going to be your skeletal muscles, the muscles surrounding your digestive tract, and blood vessels, and also the heart. Okay, so this leads us to the different uh, actual organ systems of the body. Okay, and so the first three that we're going to cover the rest of the semester, basically these are all the systems we're going over uh, during uh, the rest of the semester, all the different systems of the body. And this would be the nervous system, the integumentary system, and the immune system. I'm not going to read all of these, but you're going to have to be familiar with all three of these. So make sure you uh, familiar size, familiarize yourself with this. And I've given a copy to everybody of this of this Prezi, the link, so you guys can come back and pause this Prezi and uh, kind of look at it yourself and explore it yourself. Next three are the muscular system, the circulatory system, and the skeletal system. And then uh, you also have the respiratory system, the digestive system, the excretory system, and then finally the endocrine system and the reproductive system. So we we got a lot to cover in the, in the last few weeks of school here. Uh, today we'll be focusing just on, or this week we'll be focusing just on the digestive system and the excretory systems. All right. So homeostasis and feedback inhibition. All right. So homeostasis is basically uh, maintaining a constant, uh, stable internal environment, whereas feedback inhibition is basically how cells and how tissues and organs of your body help maintain that stable internal. Okay, so when I first uh, introduce this, I like to give the analogy to the thermostat in your house. So if there is, if you want to set your thermostat at a certain temperature, so like 74 is where I leave it at my house at night times when I'm comfortable sleeping at. Um, anytime your temperature in your house goes over, over, or over, in my house goes over 74, that kicks in the AC. Okay, the AC then uh, turns on uh, or actually starts cooling the house and brings it back down to that set point. Okay, I could even set the thermostat to only hold 74 so that if it goes below 74, the actual heater cuts, uh, kicks on and actually keeps warms it back up to keep it at 74 if it goes below it to like 70 or something like that. Um, in houses, that's not very uh, efficient. So we just use AC in summertime heater 
in the in the winter time. But in our bodies, all of our chemical reactions re require specific parameters, and specific temperatures, and so what. Uh, feedback inhibition does is make sure is that even though there may be these large external fluctuations in the outer environment, if you, if you consider this square or rectangle of the animal, um, these large external fluctuations uh, do not cause big internal fluctuations in the animal. And this is because of homeostasis and feedback inhibition. And basically, uh, all the systems of the body contribute to keeping this internal environment rel relatively stable, which is again, which like I said, homeostasis. And the way they do this is by feedback inhibition. You can think about it as like, and for an example, when we get hot during the summer months, uh, we sweat more. That allows evaporation off our skin, which when the water evaporates off, it cools off our body temperature. In the winter months, we'll kick on our a higher metabolism, which releases more heat from our chemical reactions, which can then increase our temperatures that so are all always our body temperature stays within a, a set point range and so when we're looking at for the rest of the semester when we're looking at the different organs of the body i want you to always come back to how do it does that particular organ or organ system or that you know the digestive system and excretory system in this case uh, contribute to homeostasis and what type of mechanisms do they use to maintain that homeostasis all right so food calories and a balanced diet so what I have here is a website that you can go to. Um, you can kind of copy it when you access the Prezi online um, and kind of look at it. Uh, and I just want to go over it real quickly. And I know we've done this before, but you know we have our main different types of food groups. Let's see if I can find it here. Here it is. And we've talked about what carbs do, what proteins do, what we use fats for, what we use. Um, I guess is that is that all of them? Carbohydrates, uh, lipids or fats, uh, proteins. Um, we also need you know, nucleic acids. We get that from our from our diet too. Uh, so main energy comes from the carbohydrates, the glucose. We talked about that. You break that down in cellular respiration, you get ATP out. The proteins are used for growth and repair, and then any excess proteins are also converted to energy. So when your energy balance is is out of whack, if you have too much energy food than required, that's what leads to obesity. When you have uh, not enough energy, or not enough food being taken in, that's what leads to starvation, obviously. Nothing uh, big here. And I'm not going to go over on everything on here, but I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights here. You have your basal metabol metabolic rate here. Um, it's the energy needed at rest for routine task cells. Basically, this is our, our homeostasis. This is our set point, and it's going to depend on age, sex, uh, and your body size, and that's going to determine how many calories, how much energy, how much food you need to take, and what types of stuff you need to take in. Um, so big, big groups. We have our fiber. This is made up of cellulose, which is not uh, able to be broken down by enzymes in the gut. We do have some bacteria that help us break it down, but for the most part, this stuff kind of passes right through. And this is good because it reduces the absorption of carbohydrates. Why is that good? Because normally we intake way more carbohydrates than we need. Any extra carbohydrates can be turned into fat. Um, it also reduces hunger and prevents constip constipation, which I know everybody here can, can appreciate. Um, we've talked about how important water is and how all our chemical and biochemical reactions occur in water. Um, and you can kind of see there what the requirements are based on and also how it's lost through breathing, sweating, excretion, and, and diuretics. Carbs, again, this is your starch, your sugar, it provides 80% of our main energy okay it can store and transport energy glucose is the main energy source of the brain so without this stuff cells cannot do cellular respiration which means they can't do protein synthesis which means they can't carry out the different functions that they provide uh, to maintain that stable internal condition in our bodies lipids are going to be another source of, of energy they can be broken down They're like our energy resort a reserve uh, they're Precursors to other substances, they're actually needed to absorb fat-soluble vitamins, which I'll talk about below. And uh, lipids right underneath our skin is what actually maintain and keep a barrier of insulation for temperature inside our body. Proteins, we've covered this. I think we've we've uh, covered this in depth every single unit. Proteins carry out the chemistry of the body, um, and Without proteins, we need to we wouldn't be able to make all these things. So again, we break down the proteins we eat into individual amino acids, 
this allows us to make all these things that carry out all the different functions of the organ systems. And vitamins are essential for interacting with enzymes and speeding up metabolic reactions. Okay, without vitamins, we're unable to do our biochemistry, which means our chemistry slows down, which means we slow down. And so you can kind of look at all the different vitamins, and we'll cover these as we go throughout the throughout the class. Um, and then mineral ions are going to be really important when we talk about, especially sodium chloride, potassium, calcium. These are all going to be important in the nervous system, which we'll talk about later. And then you've heard of phosphate in amino acids and ATP. Iron is also important. We talked about hemoglobin in the last unit. Without iron, we would not be able to make hemoglobin, which means we would not be able to get oxygen from the environment, which means we would not be able to do cellular restoration, which means we would not be able to provide energy for our chemical reactions, which means we're basically dead. Okay, um, the, the rest of this kind of says how to get a, a healthy diet and how to make sure you get all these things you need. You're going to be responsible for knowing uh, each of those. So let's kind of go back to our uh, fancy Prezi here. Okay, so we covered the, the website. What I want you to do here uh, for, for extra credit, uh, I want you to tell me what this actually tells you. And specifically, I want to see who can tell me how many, if, if you get 110 calories from fat, Someone do the math and tell me how many uh, calories per gram of fat are you actually making? Okay, and so go ahead and look at this and uh, see if you, if you can answer that bonus question there. The other thing I wanted to cover quickly before we finish is the difference between saturated fats and uh, unsaturated fats. Saturated fats are usually associated as the unhealthy fats. Unsaturated are usually associated with the uh, fats that are that are good for you. The big difference: saturated means uh, single bonds around the carbon. You can see that this carbon is completely saturated. It's got uh, the, the bond between the carbon and then it's got two bonds with the hydrogen. So it's completely saturated with hydrogens. Whereas a unsaturated fat, these carbons are double bonded each other so they do not have a, another hydrogen bonded to them. The major chemical difference is again these guys are solid at room temperature and these are liquid at room temperature. So maybe you can come up with a a hypothesis on why these might be worse for you, especially from a cardiovascular standpoint, compared to these. And we'll see if you can answer that in class. Um, and then these are all the different minerals and, and ions. In the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of let that be there on the Prezi where you can go back to look at it. This is also in your book. All right, so that takes us all the way back to the digestive system. And what I want you to be able to do in the digestive system is basically go. Trace the pathway, and I want you to be able to tell me enzymes um, and the mechanical type of digestion that occurs at each step. So we start at the mouth. You're going to have enzymes in your saliva. One of the ones we talked about was amylase. Um, and then it gets passed down through your esophagus through a process called peristalsis. The stomach muscles, the stomach is a huge muscle that receives the food then, and it basically will churn the food into a mixture. And there will also begin your protein digestion, your food digestion with the hydrochloric acid and with some of the other enzymes that are in there. We then get past the small intestine where the main site of absorption of food or nutrients is going to occur. And then the large intestines where we can get water out of it. And so you're going to be responsible for knowing what happens at each step. Peristalsis is how basically things get moved to your digestive tract. And these are kind of waveform contractions with your muscles. So this really we're talking about the muscular system here too as part of the digestive system. The muscles surround your esophagus and they're also going to surround your intestinal tract. This is what actually pushes the food through in this case the stomach and then in the intestine those same types of peristaltic uh, muscle contractions are going to move the food through the small intestine and large intestine. Here's your your small intestine which you'll see is these folds and these folds a big big concept here is increased surface area. So if we zoom in on your intestinal tract and look at these, these increased folds are going to increase the contact you have with food and the ability to absorb food. And they're called microvilli, these things that uh, kind of are extensions of the cellular membrane. And what you'll see is if you zoom in even further on these, is this is where you got your respiratory system, your, your circulatory system that's going to be picking up those nutrients, putting them in circulation so all the rest of the cells can get it. All right, so here is a table that would be good to actually memorize. And not like just memorize the table, but memorize it in conjunction with this picture back here. I think that's going to be your, uh, your best bet of actually being able to memorize it. So let's go back to the table. And 
what I want you to know is the enzymes that occur at each step and what they break down. Okay, so make sure you review that. That takes us finally all the way over to excretion.